Hello everyone. Welcome to today's Solar Thermal Applications and Basic Design webinar, a one hour, one PDH credited presentation. My name is Miranda Getling and I'm the Wiesman Academy Manager. I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for attending today and I hope that you are all staying safe and healthy at this time. Today, your webinar instructor will be Jody Samuel. Jody is a graduate of Maine Maritime Academy with a degree in marine engineering. Over the past 20 plus years, he has worked with various companies, including Amtrol, Wiesman, and Kalefi, serving in various roles, including application engineer, product manager, training manager, and manager for engineering education. Currently, he serves as project development manager, manager for Wiesman. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. As stated, this is a one PDH credited presentation. If you indicated upon registration that you would like to receive this credit, you will receive um, it once you fill out the required survey, which will be emailed out to you at the end of this webinar. Once I have submitted the PDH credit, due to the current situation, we will be emailing you a PDF version of the certificate within about five business days. If you would like a hard copy mailed out to you after this quarantine period, please let me know and I'll make sure that is done as soon as possible. Everyone will stay muted throughout the webinar. However, you do have the opportunity to ask any questions during this webinar by the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. On the left, you will see the desktop laptop version and on the right is the mobile device version. Jody will be stopping about halfway through the presentation and at the end to answer any questions that have been submitted. This webinar will be recorded and it will be available in the next week or two on the video library located on the same website you went to to register for this webinar. Once you are in that video library, you will select the recorded webinars section, and then you will have to hit the discover more button probably a few times for the videos to populate. This should be up within the next week or so as well, so you will have the opportunity to go back and rewatch this webinar at any time. With that being said, let's begin. Here is Jody Samuel. Thank you, Miranda. So uh, today's presentation is Solar Thermal Applications and Design Basic. As Miranda said, my name is Jody Samuel. I am work for Wiesman and um, we'll be, I'll be covering today's topic with you. So first, a couple of housekeeping slides. So Miranda talked about the, the CEU or the continuing education unit or the PDH. Uh, again, our statement on that and uh, the organization that we're associated with in delivering uh, the PDH. Um, the presentation is copyrighted. It's, it's product, uh, the property of Wiesman, but if you'd like a copy of it, when you fill out the survey, make a note and Miranda can get you a copy of it as a PDF. And now on to the learning objectives. And today is really about application and the basics of solar. And so we're really going to go kind of get down to the base level, you know, one hour, you know, a pretty tight time to cover a lot of information. In fact, yesterday we went over by about a minute or two, but these are our learning objectives. State the most common application for solar thermal water heating, list several site considerations for optimum system performance, explain how to determine the appropriate quantities of collectors and correct storage volume, state the two most common solar preheat storage tank layouts, and finally, list the pre-designed steps needed to properly design a solar domestic hot water system. Now, when we talk about solar, thermal solar, it's interesting to see what's happened in the industry, say, about over the past 15, 16 years. You know, it's something that, you know, about 15, 16 years ago, the business picked up. A lot of people got into um, thermal solar, and then the business started to drop off. But as a company, we still continue to do thermal solar. You know, the projects still uh, keep coming in, going out. So it's something that still needs to be talked about. Now, when we talk about thermal solar for projects, a lot of different things come to mind in the eyes of the people associated with the project. First one that comes up is always about free. I want to harvest free energy from the sun. You know, that's that's something that you definitely can do with solar. Sometimes it's well, I need, my project needs lead points and lead points gets them, uh, you know, solely get some lead points in the project. That's not unusual as well. It could be I want to reduce my carbon emission. It could be I, I want to offset fossil, fossil fuel costs. Um, the thing with thermal solar is 
it's not the be all and end all of adding heat into the building. So it's really about how we apply it and utilize it properly within the building. Okay. Now, when we talk about thermal solar, it's so thermal solar is really a small segment of the solar market. We talk solar, most people right now immediately think about photovoltaic, PV. PV is one form, thermal solar is another. Thermal solar is really about liquid heating, as you see over here. And we're going to look at it through the aspect of low temperature operations. Typically, we're looking at glaze collectors. Glaze collector means there's a sheet of glass involved in the, the design of the collector. And from a design standpoint, it's really about pool heating, domestic hot water heating, and space heating. Now, where we deal with is what's called closed loop glycol systems right here. Closed loop glycol systems, they can be pool heating, domestic hot water heating, or space heating in cold climates. So that's really the segment of the market that we're really dealing with. Now, we talk about a pressurized closed loop system. Here's a good example of what we're really talking about from an aspect of solar. So it's gonna be a system with the solar panels on the roof and somewhere in that solar panel, we're going to pump a fluid. You see down here, heat transfer fluid. Our fluid happens, the fluid happens to be a uh, water poly polypropylene glycol mix. Uh, why the glycol mix? This collector is sitting outside the building. It has solar fluid in it. Because it's a pressurized closed loop system, there's always fluid inside this collector. So we have to worry about overheating and we also have to worry about freezing. That's why we're doing a heat transfer fluid. So it gets heated in the collector. You have a pumping station. It gets pumped down into a tank. We're gonna extract the energy out in that tank to store for later usage. And then it simply gets pumped back up to the collector again. Because it's a closed loop system, there is an expansion tank and there's a relief valve also to help maintain the proper pressurization of the system. Now over here, you'll hear see something called domestic hot water backup source. Key thing with thermal solar is it, it cannot be the sole source of heat into the building for an application. Okay? The amount of energy that's available changes day to day. So there has to be a backup source there for when solar energy is not available. In fact, the backup source normally size for 100% of the load. But when we talk about what we do in the world of solar, it is glaze collectors, it is uh, pressurized closed loop systems. And this drawing here is a snapshot of what we, we are doing from an aspect of solar. By the way, this snapshot is true whether I'm doing a small residential system with two or three collectors or a larger commercial system with 50 collectors. The scope of the project changes, but the basic components do not. Now, when we're doing thermal solar, a lot of times the question comes up about what, what can we do and what should we be doing? Because with thermal solar, with glaze collectors, pressurized closed loop systems, I can do domestic hot water heating. I can also heat a pool or I can also heat space, space heating. Um, and the, over the years, I have done projects with one, two, or all three of these built into the projects itself. The thing is, when you look at the amount of, I'm gonna go with the term bang for the buck, when I look at the application that best suits solar from a payback standpoint and an impact standpoint on all the things we talked about on the front end, it's really about domestic hot water heating. So it's your most effective investment application. When I do domestic hot water annually, in most cases, I'm going to get at least 50% of my hot water annually out of, um, out of my thermal solar system. So it makes a big impact and the performance of the system. Also, domestic hot water is your most abundant opportunity. You know, domestic hot water is part of every residential building, whether it's single family home or apartment buildings. And a lot of commercial buildings as well also have the need for domestic hot water. So it's, it's, the jobs are far and wide and it's the biggest impact when we start looking at what we can do with uh, a thermal solar system. Now, these are ideas of performance numbers here, and we're looking at this more from the uh, aspect of a residential system to give you a feel for it. So if I look at typical residential domestic hot water system with solar, I'm probably going to have somewhere between 60 to 100 square feet of collector on the roof, probably somewhere between two to maybe four collectors on the roof itself. 
I'm also going to have an 80 to 120 gallon storage tank down in the building somewhere. Okay. And what this system will deliver, if I'm looking at families of two to five, that system, if properly sized, should deliver somewhere between 60 to 70% of their domestic hot water needs on an annual basis. We call this the solar fraction. It's the part of a load that's carried on solar. So annually, we should be able to get about 60 to 70% of the, the energy that, that's needed. From a savings standpoint, that's looking at getting somewhere between 10 and 14 million BTUs of energy saved. That's also three quarters to a ton of CO2 that's not gonna be added to the atmosphere. And if everything is designed properly, maintained and um, installed properly, it's something that should li live well beyond 25 years of operating life. You know, the solar collectors, if, they're, if you see like on the roof here, the collectors should outlive the, roof, the roofing material that's below it if, if it's an asphalt shingle. So from an aspect of what we're trying to do, this kind of gives you a snapshot of what we're trying to deliver when we start to look at doing thermal solar for domestic hot water. Okay. Now, the thing with doing solar is thermal solar, actually solar in general, there's big variations in performance based on a number of different factors. And when we start to look at those kind of factors, what we really need to talk to first about how much energy is really available and how does that change when we start to look at the other factors that are out there. So from an energy standpoint, yeah, the energy is coming from the sun. You know, we do have about 440 BTUs per hour per square feet available of solar energy coming from the sun before that energy starts to enter the Earth's, the Earth's atmosphere. Now, as it enters the atmosphere, some of it's absorbed in the atmosphere into the clouds. Some of it is scattered. So when I look at it, what I'm really seeing is it's probably somewhere between about 170 to 315 BTUs per hour per square foot makes it down here to the Earth's surface. So that's the number we have to start thinking about when we start to say, okay, how much energy is available to actually be able to do something with that solar on the Earth's surface for somebody's house. Now, the other thing that happens is this isn't, scat through here isn't the only place that we start to lose energy, okay? It's also based on where you are in the world. So here's a map of, of North America. And you'll notice these different areas of different colors based on certain amounts of kilowatt hours per square meters per day. So for instance, I'm, I'm right up here in uh, Rhode Island. I'm in this green area, which is three to four kilowatt per meter per square day. So if we look at that and translate it over to BTUs per square foot per day, because we are in the United States, that works to out to somewhere between 945 to 1260 BTUs per square foot per day is available to uh, generate for, in the case of what we're talking about, hot water with solar. If I move off to the West Coast, down here into the Southeast, Western part of this, the country, all of a sudden I'm in the six to seven range. Six to seven kilowatts per square meter per day, that equates to 1890 to 2205 BTUs per square foot per day. So two different spots in continental US, the difference in the energy available is, is, is a factor of two. I have twice as much energy available here to work with than I do in the Northeast. So although we say this 315 BTUs per square foot per hour maximum peak, you know that is variable and one of the variables are where you are living. Now, the other variable that plays into it is also how much of that energy is actually getting through the collector and making its way into the building. So if I look here and I say, okay, here's my sun, here's the sun shining down on it. And you know, right about here, as, as it gets to the collector, I have 315 BTUs per hour per square foot, that, the, that opening number. Now, the thing is, in order to get it into the building, there are also associated losses. So this is a sheet of glass up here. So some of that energy is going to reflect off. There's a loss there. Also, some of the energy is going to be absorbed and held in the glass itself. There's another loss. So I have those losses. Some of it penetrate the glass and it now gets down to the absorber. The absorber, although it has a selective coating that helps the absorption, a certain percentage of it is going to be reflected off just as with the glass. 
Now, once that energy is in the collector, some of it is lost through um, the backside, through the insulation. Some of it is lost as radiation off the front side. And because this glass doesn't, have, between the glass and the collect the absorber, because there isn't a vacuum there, I also end up with convection current setting up and I lose energy as well. So when I look at what's coming down onto the face of the collector, which is versus what is actually leaving the collector and going into the house, there's energies, energy that's also lost there. We add some numbers to it. Here's my outer space number we talked about. That's the, the ultimate potential. Here is my performance when I get to the surface of the earth. You know, all of a sudden I've gone to 440 down to 315. But when I'm looking at the collector itself, I have collector losses that you see over here. And what that really means is when I look at what's actually deliverable into the building as a maximum, the maximum collector available power is 220 BTUs per hour per square foot. So for those of you that might've done a project with us somewhere in the past, and we've mentioned about having heat rejection, we always size the heat rejection at 220 BTUs per hour per square foot. We're sizing based on worst case scenario. So that's where that number comes from. But that's about the maximum that, can, that we'll potentially see come out of any collector anywhere in North America. So the question then comes up when we start to look at doing solar. You know, so we will call up and say, um, I'm thinking about doing three panels. What, how much hot water am I gonna get out of it? Yeah, the question really isn't, isn't a straightforward question to answer like if we're doing a boiler. So if I have a boiler over here, it's pretty straightforward to figure out what's coming out of it. I know the boiler's efficiency. I know the fuel it's burning. You can calculate how many BTUs per hour are coming out of that boiler or BTUs per day if that boiler is running straight out. But when I do solar, there's so much that plays into it. It's all about the solar radiation level. It's also about where that panel is located. What's my outdoor air temperature? What's my collector fluid temperature? What's the azimuth of the collector? What's the inclination? All of this plays into the, uh, the performance of the collector. So it's never a straightforward answer. You know, in most cases, when we start to doing solar, it becomes, do I residentially, do I do a quick estimation with rules of thumb to put a number out there? Or do I need to go through and do a simulation with the software package to actually generate the numbers that are important? And we'll, we'll talk about both methods as we make our way through. Okay, so we start to look at predicting solar performance the questions always come up about hourly performance or daily performance or yearly. Now, personally, I hate, I stay away from hourly performance because if somebody says, you know, what's the hourly performance of the solar collector? My answer always is at 7 a.m. it's zero. At 7 p.m. it's probably zero as well. And then between those two hours, it's gonna meet, meet a peak, but it's never gonna be consistent for the entire time period. So from an hourly standpoint, to me, that really isn't good data because it's not a number you can grab onto and work with. Yeah. From a performance standpoint, it's really about daily. What's the daily number that I can, I can get out of a collector? Now, yearly comes into play if somebody's looking at long-term savings. And we'll look at that when we look at the software packages. But from the aspect of performance, try and always think about daily. Daily is where we have to focus because the variation in the solar collector performance. Now, if I'm looking at daily numbers and somebody wants to look at it specifically for a panel under a test condition, like we'd be looking at for a boiler, uh, this is the group that does the rating of solar. So it's the Solar Rating and Certification Corporation, also referred to as the SRCC, okay? On the bottom are the specifications of the collectors. So this collector happens to have a net aperture area of 25.08 feet. That's the actual area that's picking up the solar energy. Up here is the thermal performance, up here in kilowatt hours, so the metric system numbers, and then the numbers that we understand here better in the United States. So let's kind of take this and blow it up. Now when we look at the rating, it's not just a single rating that the collectors get, it's a series of ratings, because it, we do, they do recognize that the performance of the panels change dramatically. Is it under low radiation, medium radiation, or high radiation? A thousand B2s per square foot per day, 1,500 or 2,000 BTUs per square foot per day, okay? And then it's about the categories. And the categories are listed down here. 
So for instance, you see category C here. C is warm, warm heating, water heating in a warm climate. Okay. You'll notice the number of 36 here. 36 represents the temperature difference between the fluid in the collector and the atmosphere around the collector. So that's what, so when we start to look at a collector rating, it becomes, okay, let's look at the number here, and then let's look here, here, or here. Typically, when we're doing domestic hot water in the United States in most areas, and somebody's trying to look at the performance of a collector, normally they'll look at C. But a C, at a C climate with high radiation, this collector will produce 27,800 BTUs of energy. Medium radiation, it drops down to 18,700. Low radiation, 9,700. So you notice how the performance changes as the radiation changes. The performance changes also at, based on the, the change in the, um, the category as well. But if you're looking at this and somebody says, okay, that's a great number, you know, or what a lot of times will come up is somebody will try say, I'm doing a comparison between collectors, which one's giving me better performance under the conditions. This number here represents performance for the entire collector for that 25.08 square foot aperture. If somebody actually is doing a comparison and looking for a number to work with, if I take this collector output and I divide it by the square footage of the collector's aperture, I can figure out what it's actually doing on a per hour, I mean, excuse me, a per foot, square foot basis. So although the collector under high radiation is producing 27,800 BTUs by per square foot, if you look on the bottom there, it's producing 1108.5 BTUs per square foot per day. You know, so that's kind of a comparison number when you're trying to match up, you're trying to look at collector performance, how they do under very specific conditions. But for a performance number for per, either looking at per hour, per day, or per year, you know, I always like to look at it from the aspect of per day because that's how we're going to size. And these are some numbers for the collector's performance. And these numbers also play into the simulation when we start to get the, the software. Okay. Now, it's not just about the radiation that's available, high, medium, or low. It's also about the collector's ability to pick up the, that radiation based on the, the restrictions or the limitations of the site. Now with solar, site can, the site has to be considered. Again, it's not like doing a boiler or a water heater with a burner in it. The burner doesn't care about trees. It doesn't care about if the sun shines on it. You know, I can put a boiler anywhere and get the output that I'm, it's needed. But when I do solar, it has to be site specific. Yeah, because you know, the easiest way to say it, you know, if, if you stick the collector where the sun doesn't shine, the collectors actually do nothing. So you gotta you gotta really pay attention to that. Now, a couple of things that play into it. I want this collector to work for me 365 days a year. During the course of the year, the sun's position in the sky changes as the seasons change. And during the course of the day, the sun's position in the sky changes as well. You know, normally from about, you know, from a collector standpoint, somewhere between around 8.30 and 9 o'clock in the morning till around 4.35 o'clock in the evening. So when we start to look at um, solar design, we have to make sure that this is maximized both for the summertime operation, for the wintertime, excuse me, the win summertime operation, the wintertime operation, early morning, late afternoon. I have to get it all in. So it's really what's des described as checking out what you have for the solar window. So the solar window is looking at the location where the collectors are going, and then looking at anything on the south, the, the southeast, the southwest, you know, even the east and west that may get in the way of the sun shining on that collector. So when we look at this for, for suitability, there's a couple of things that we pay attention to. Okay. First off, let's take a look at the angle. So let's say if this is south, sitting south here, we have to make sure that we have a wide area where the sun is available without any shade. So preferably, if you look at that location from around nine o'clock in the morning till about four o'clock in the afternoon, I won't have an area without shade to maximize performance. Now, if I don't have this, I still can do solar, but it may reduce the performance of it, you know, three, five, 10, 15%, depending on 
what you have with trees. Yeah. If you have a, if this is a, a two story building and we're sitting right here, you have a 50 story building, it may not be a good idea because all of a sudden the contribution may be, you know, down where you're losing 75% you know, of it because of the shade that building represents. Now, also, not only do we need the angle as far as the, off the azimuth itself clear, but we also have to make sure that we also are clear from the shallow angle of the sun in the wintertime to the high angle of the sun in the summertime. So we wanna make sure that there's no shade on December 21st. So it's again, looking at the trees to, and the angle where the collectors are facing and making sure that that those trees are no more than about a 20 degree angle as it shows here off of there to, to make sure that I have proper shade, pro proper exposure because of the solar window. Now, the question always comes, because I'm always making this discussion of, I want the sun sitting there. Okay. From a performance standpoint, the best performance is if the site has a Southern exposure, true self. That gives me the best performance from early in the morning to late in the afternoon, okay? However, because of the way the sun comes up and the sun sets, the site is suitable as long as it's within 45 degrees east or west of south. So you have a, a wide 90 degree slot available. So, you know, it's not where you take a look at your house on Google Earth to verify that the roof line is running east-west to put solar in there. You know, if it's not running east-west, if I'm off that 45 degrees in either direction, I still will get good solar performance. And good solar means I'm probably still within about 10, maybe it's probably about 10% of what I would see if I face it due south. So the, the window, the, this window is actually much larger when you look at the azimuth. Now, the other thing that we have to consider is the tilt of the collector or the angle of the collector, okay? If I am doing a pitched roof and I'm putting it on here, I might be locked into the pitch there because of aesthetic qualities. Yeah, commercially, if I'm putting it somewhere ground mounted, there'll be a free standing rack that I can make that adjustment on. But from a performance number, there's always going to be a best number when it comes to the angle, okay? Because from a performance standpoint, I want the collector to be sitting 90 degrees to the, so the sun. That gives me the maximum amount of BTUs per square foot on that collector surface area. Now, one of the things that we don't do is we don't do tracking thermal solar systems. They're always in a fixed position. So when we do that fixed position, the fixed position will be a compromise because the, as the sun moves with the seasons, as that sun moves, we are changing the angle of the sun to the face of the collector and the performance is going to change. So we have to choose the best angle. And the best compromise angle is the latitude of the location. So if you're somewhere up here in the, the Northeast where the latitude is 40 degrees, 40 degrees is the best angle for that collector to maximize performance throughout the year. If you're uh, you know, a few miles north of 40 degrees and all of a sudden your latitude is 45, now 45 is your number. And that gives you the best performance throughout the course of the year. Now you can also, if you're doing a system that you can set the angle and you're not tied to the, the pitch of the roof, you can also change it to change the bias of the system. So if I bring that collector up to a steeper angle, the steeper angle all of a sudden, rather than being on, you know, at the compromise, all of a sudden, it's starting to get better coverage later in the, the season, into the middle of the winter. So when I do a winter bias load, I go to a higher angle. You know, a lot of times where that comes into play is if somebody is doing um, space heating, they'll go to a higher angle. Or they have a, a, um, something where they want to have a higher number, you know, possibly a school where the school's closed in the summertime. So you can bring it up to, to change that number to favor the, the wintertime months or I could bring the angle down lower to favor of the summer or having a summer bias. You know, I have something that I want to have a higher number in the summer. You know, a, a facility that has a community pool that we're providing hot water for showers for that pool. Very little usage, a lot of times in the middle of the winter time, but great usage in the summer. I bring it down on the angle in the middle of the summertime, my performance is higher in the summer. So when we start to look at the, the angle or the tilt of the collector, 
there's an ideal number. There's a way to bias it. Um, a lot of times, if you're doing a uh, a, um, a roof mounted uh, system on a sloped roof, the collector goes at the angle of the roof. It just depending on the angle, the angle probably will give it. In most cases, the angle is probably going to be less than the uh, ideal. It's just going to give you a much higher summertime bias on it. But if I can choose my angle, there is a best angle to achieve, and it's really based on the latitude of the location. Now, looks like we're at a good point for questions. We're about halfway through. So Miranda, uh, anything out there? Looks like there are no questions at this time, Jody. All right, yeah. It looks like the, the solar groups are not as inquisitive as the, the guys that we've had, the, the, the attendees we've had for some of the boiler base. So we'll keep moving on with it. So we start to go in and we start to look at sizing. Now, a lot of, there's a lot of different approaches to sizing, and a lot of it could be based on rules of thumb, and some of it can also be based on um, calculations with software. Now, uh, a lot of times, particularly in the residential, we tend to see um, a lot, probably more rules of thumb sizing rather than through the software, uh, because of the fact that uh, you know we do thermal solar, there there may be on occasion, the sticker shock. You know, so you know you don't want to sit there and spend devote a whole lot of time sizing a system, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you put a couple of hours into the quote because of what you've done, and then the, they come back, you give them a number in there saying, "Geez, I was hoping it was half of that," and so uh, so all that time is lost. So a lot of times, it's nice to know the rules of thumb, so you can put something together, put a number out there. And that way there, you know, if they say, well, you know, is there a way to find out more information? If they're still interested with the numbers there, then you can start looking at how to simulate it and uh, get a higher performance number. But from an aspect of sizing, really the two key pieces are um, the number of collectors and the number of tanks. So what size tanks do I need to store the, uh, the water that's being generated off of, of solar? And the two of them are related, by the way. So when I start to look at design, and I look at the number of collectors, there is a, a, an optimum number to achieve. And the one thing that we don't want to have is we really don't want to, actually, get a little ahead here. So when I start to look at the design, you know, the sun's energy is the variable. And this is why when we do thermal solar systems, we tend to size based on not providing 100% of the energy, but something a little bit lower on the annual basis. And that's also why we, we put storage in the system to be able to work with that variable nature of it. Now, from a design standpoint, every site has to be evaluated. You know, you know, because of looking at the solar window and the exposure, um, every somebody has to go out there and take a look at every single site. Now, one of the questions a lot of times when I've done solar in the past, people have always been like, you know, Jody, do you have solar on your house? You, you know, you talk a lot about it. And this was, you know, I've talked a lot about it back around 2008, 2007, when solar was really, really popular. And, you know, today I'm working from my home office, which is also known as the back of my bedroom. And if I look out my window, my bed, my house sits where looking out my bedroom window, I'm facing in the, about a Southwest direction. And I look more towards the south, and the first thing I see is a pine tree, which is about 50 to 60 feet tall. Okay. So, you know, I look at it and say, you know, I'd love to have thermal solar on the house, but that one tree right there kind of keys me in that I probably don't have a good site. So the site parameters have to be considered. You don't want to over design. You're designing for a well functioning system. And well functioning means. The, when the sun comes up, the solar system runs for the entire day, gathers all the energy it, it can, and all that energy is used into the building. You know, for a lot of guys that have done boilers, this is kind of a, a little bit different concept because in the world of boilers, you want to make sure you cover the load. Uh, with this, you know, we're really not looking to cover the load for every single day of the year. We're looking for our best payback from an investment standpoint and the best performance. So don't over-design the system. And again, as I said earlier, consider using rules of thumb. You know, these, a lot of these rules of thumbs are, are field tested for residential type application. Not a lot of time invested that way there. If uh, the homeowner doesn't want to go for it because of the cost of the project, 
you haven't wasted a lot of time up front, and then you can start to de devote the time later on if they are interested from that standpoint. Okay, so what are some of these rules of thumb? Well, the first thing is whenever we look at solar systems, it's always about, first off, how much panel do I need to take care of the needs of the building? Okay, so here's a recommended ratio looking at the number of occupants in the building to um, square foot of collector. So for the first two occupants of the, the building, I need 20 square foot of collector per person. So if I have two people in the building, I need 40 square foot of collector. Now, once I get beyond the first two, I want to add an additional 15 square foot for each additional occupant. So for two occupants, that's 40 square feet. For three occupants, that's 55. For four occupants, it's 70 square feet. So nice, easy, clean rule of thumb to figure out how many collectors are needed. Okay. You know, from a collector standpoint, two occupants, you know, working these number here, that's two collectors, three occupants, three collectors actually, just a little bit more than two, so I'm gonna push it up to three four occupants, three collectors as well. So, you know, the numbers start to pull together from this, this aspect, okay? Now, the next thing that I have to figure out is how much solar storage do I need, okay? Storage has to be part of every single project because there is a mismatch between generation and usage. So this little bubble right here, that little bubble there represents generation of solar energy. So sometime in the morning, somewhere around nine o'clock, the solar, the solar domestic hot water system starts to generate. Somewhere around five o'clock in the afternoon, it also shuts down as well. So I generate all of my heat with my solar panels for a fraction of the day. And if I look at the hot water usage profile, I have a hot water peak in the morning before I'm starting to generate. And then I have a peak couple of little smaller peaks in the evening as well when it's not generating. So it's all about gathering up the energy and storing it in my, my solar storage tank for the period of time that it's, it is available and then utilize this stored energy to deliver into the building during the peaks in the evening and then this peak in the morning as well. So that, so, that storage has to be part of the, the equation. How much storage? Well, it's all about how much collectors I have. Okay, so if I'm looking at a ratio for storage to collector, I need about one to two gallons of storage per square foot of collector. Okay, now that's a little bit of a gap here and somebody say, can you be a little bit more specific? Generally, a lot of people will size based on one and a quarter gallons per square foot of collector. Okay, so if I look at something here, so two panels, I'm gonna have a certain size tank as the as my collectors become more and more, as you see here, it's a lot more than two collectors here, the tank's volume has to be increased uh, proportionally. So residentially for rules of thumb, if I have two panels, you know, two panels is gonna be about an 80 gallon tank. If I have three panels, those three panels are gonna be a 120 gallon tank. And with those two panels of, of collector area, and this storage of uh, 80, 80 gallons, you know, those two panels represent probably two to three people in the house. And this system here will deliver somewhere between the 60 to 70% solar fraction. Again, these are average numbers. The numbers do change as you move across the United States. If I have three panels, three panels are gonna be into a 120 gallon tank. So those three panels and 120 gallon tanks We'll deliver that same 60 to 70% solar fraction, but now for three to five individuals. Okay. So from a sizing standpoint, you know, that the, you know, we start to look at it, we we size for the load when it comes to the panels, we size the storage tank based on the number of panels, and it's about making sure we have enough volume to store all the energy those panels are going to be generating for that application. Okay. Now, what happens when I start to look at it beyond just using rules of thumb? And when I'm doing, not doing rules of thumb, I'm now into software. So if somebody comes into to our office and says, I need to design a solar system, we give them a checklist. And the checklist carries the things that we need to know to size that system, okay? So some of these things are, you know, what's the application? 
okay. Different buildings use hot water differently. You know, is it a school? Is it a restaurant? Is it an apartment building? Is it a motel? Is it a gymnasium? Do, you know, do they have a swimming pool? We have to know the application because from that application, we can use that as one of our pieces of information to figure out their hot water usage. Okay, what's the average daily load? And it does have to be daily. Okay, so we want to see domestic hot water requirements in gallons per day. Now, when it comes to designing a solar system, the fact that you that there is a 120 gallon water heater in the house hooked up to a 250,000 BTU boiler doesn't really mean anything sizing for, for solar. Because when that was sized, it was looking at a peak period. That peak period could have been an hour, it could have been a minute. And what, when we do solar, we're looking at how much is used over the entire course of the day. Because that's, that's what we're trying to size for from a daily standpoint. So we have to be in a, in a per day basis. We also need to know the water temperature requirement. How hot does the water need to be? When the water goes hotter, that means I need more energy to bring it up the additional degrees of temperature. Additionally, if the water temperature is increased, the solar panels efficiency drop. So not only do I need more, but I'm getting less. So that has to be accounted for, particularly in large commercial buildings where you know that may be the difference of two or three, four panels into the system. So we need the water temperature requirement. We need the usage profile. Is it daily? You know, is it the same every single day, or every single week, or every single month, or are there things that change? A building that's only really is occupied Monday through Fridays, you know, or a school that's closed um, in the middle of June, July, and then through August. We look at these usage profile. They have to play into the system design, particularly when we start to think about something called heat rejection, because I need to get rid of that heat to keep that system running to make sure I meet the expectation of 25 years, okay? But again, you know, this, this is probably uh, looking at what we do from a solar standpoint. Sometimes th finding this single piece of information is like pulling teeth. It is the daily load, it is gallons per day. Yeah. So the size of the water heater, the size of the boiler, you know, all of those information really does not help in the designing of a solar system. It has to be on a per day basis. Okay. Now, once we get beyond the usage, then it's about the other information. What's the mounting method? Is it going directly on a roof? Is it freestanding? Is it ballasted? Is it anchored? Um, is it going outside on the, is it gonna be a ground mount? How much roof space is available? What's the orientation of the roof so we know how long, what size or how, how big a bank of collectors need to be? What about the mechanical room? Where is it located? Uh, how far away is the piping? How much room do you have for tanks? You know, commercially, you may start to get into large vol storage volumes, 300, 500, 1,000 gallons, depending on the use. What's the building characteristics? Are there any shading? All of that has to come into play. What's the target? What's the target solar fraction? You know, are they looking for 50% in, in, of, in, of uh, solar contribution or are they looking for 70% or 30%? What's the customer's expectations? All of this comes into play when we design a solar system and these are needed numbers. Now, when it comes to domestic draw, as I said earlier, I really don't want to know the firing rate of the water heater or the volume of the water heater or the water heater's first hour rating or its continuous rating. I need to know what's happening on a daily basis. The best way is if I can meter, if this is an existing building, can I meter the amount of water that's coming, that's being utilized in that building on a daily basis? This is true, this is a true number. This is the number that I'm going to work off of. It may be difficult in existing building to get, to get get that meter in there or somebody may not have one to put in there. Next question or the second best really is okay, can we look at the gas usage for generating hot water? You know, if the building has gas for hot water and gas for heat space heating, well let's look at it from the aspect of how much gas you're using in the middle of summer. You know, you shouldn't be heating on that side of things. You know, but uh, you know what we're really trying to do here with the gas is we're trying to look at the gas consumption 
the efficiency of the boiler, the temperature rise of the water, and we can back ourselves into a usage to utilize in our calculation. Because from, from the aspect of the usage, we don't want to oversize the system. And also, when we start to look at it, energy savings in the solar fraction, we need to know what's being used for hot water so that those numbers can be a close, a close approximation of what we should save from, uh, from that angle. Okay. Now, if none of this information is available, then it comes down to, well, how can I estimate it? Okay, couple of rules of thumb. So in a residential home, single family home, 15 to 20 gallons of domestic hot water per person per day. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a number and if you, I think if you look at some of the stuff from a DOE, the number is probably pretty close. If you're doing a multifamily apartment building, 10 to 12 gallons of domestic hot water per person per day. If you're not doing one of these two applications, if it's a commercial building, uh, now it's time to pull out the ASHRAE manuals. And I want to say ASHRAE um, applications, chapter 50 is domestic hot water. I tend to spend a lot of time in that manual, but in there they will give you average domestic hot water usage for, for some typical type applications for commercial buildings. Yeah, so when everything else fails, if somebody can't come up with a number, my, my fallback is always to pull out the ASHRAE manual. The numbers will be a little different. You know, for instance, down here, you have a multifamily apartment number. The ASHRAE manual has one as well. So this is done by, by per person per day. For instance, in ASHRAE, it's always about the application. So it's per apartment per day. So here's 10 to 12 gallons of hot water per person per day. If I'm doing a 50 unit apartment and I pull my number out of the ASHRAE manual, it's gonna tell me 40 gallons per day of hot water per apartment. So there's a little bit difference between the two. But again, if, the, if somebody can't, if you can't find a number somewhere else, you know, here's some numbers to work with, okay? Now, the other thing I keep on mentioning is we don't want to oversize or we don't want the system to be oversized or uh, made larger than what's needed. And that's really all about the cons looking at the consumption versus generation. I never want the generation to be greater than the consumption. So if I look at the month by month daily consumption, the goal is that consumption is always going to be above the, the solar yield, as you see here. Because the minute the, the solar yield gets above the consumption, that means I'm generating more heat than I need to utilize. My efficiency is low, my contribution, my contribution is high, but my efficiency is low, and now I have to make sure that I'm rejecting it somewhere to maintain um, long-term uh, viability of the system. So we have to size based on the lowest expected load during the best summer conditions, okay? And that really is something that the software is so key to, to work with because you can see it as you make those adjustments in the software program, okay? So when we look at systems and we're trying to size for optimization, it's always a, a balance between the solar fraction that's needed and the system efficiency. And there's always going to be a band, and you can see where the two of them cross. Somewhere around that cross point is always going to be the, um, the best when I look at it from an aspect of absorber surface area versus system efficiency. So in order to achieve this, I have to know the load. I have to know the parameters for the solar um, site. I, then I use solar simulation software. And this is really the, the key to to get a good simulation with good numbers for, for solar systems, okay? So how does the solar software work? Well, there's a, set, a couple of them out here. I've used two of them. So up here, red screen's a great, great one. It, uh, I think it's still free. It's generated by the Canadian government. You just have to register to use it. But, um, you know, it's, it's a solid program and it's something I recommend anybody that's thinking about solar, take a look at it and probably use it. I have not done anything with this poly sun, so I'm really not, I don't have much information about it. But then down here, T cell, um, that's what we use in my office uh, when it's time to, uh, to generate a solar quote. So how does it work? Well, it's all based on historic weather data, radiation, air temperatures, you know, cloud cover, cloud cover, everything else is built into this. As far as inputs, we're gonna need to know the domestic hot water usage, the load, the quantity, types of collectors, storage volumes, piping. Uh, we need to know the backup heat source and um, everything about the location. 
And then what it will do is it will calculate the solar radiation on the collectors. And when it says the radiation, it will also calculate the number of collectors that are needed. It'll also calculate the tank size. So it calculates the, the radiation, the collector efficiency, the piping and tank losses. And it, again, it calculates the size tank that's needed. It also calculates the number of collectors that are needed as well. Because up here, you're gonna select your type of collectors. Okay. Now, what it will predict based on all this information is your energy output of solar system, solar fraction, efficiency, fuel savings, kind of like this here. So this is the results from a solar simulation. So this is a project that uh, somebody ran. And based on the inputs for the system and the selection of the tanks and the collectors, this project is going to save uh, about 211 therms of natural gas a year. It's going to avoid 2,765 pounds of CO2 emissions. The solar fraction is going to provide 68.5% of the hot water for this application. And the collector efficiency is 38.5. So it gives, these are good information and it tends to be when somebody's really trying to justify doing thermal solar, you know, these tend to be the information numbers that they're looking for to, make, to help make that decision. Okay, now the other thing that the, the simulation software gives you, which is important from our standpoint, when we start to look at designing the system is we don't want the system to be oversized. We don't have the oversize for the application. So it gives you a graph here, and this looks at temperature spikes, the temperature on a daily basis of those collectors. And typically a well-designed system, the temperature is gonna be staying somewhere down here, as you see along here. All these spikes indicate that uh, the temperature, something is causing a condition where we're not pulling the heat off of the collector. That could be an oversized collector array. It could be an undersized tank, or it could be something where the, there's no load present. Well, for instance, a school that they're not using hot water on a Saturday or a Sunday. But from this, I mean, we look at these, you know, this always is an indication. Let's look, go back and look at the overall design, and then let's start, take a look and see what we need to do for heat rejection or heat dumping on that system. But again, this is a key component that comes out of um, that simulation software. If I don't address this and I just go forward with it, yeah. what you're going to find is your solar fluid life is going to be shortened dramatically. And if you don't maintain your solar fluid, the system life can be maintained, can be uh, shortened dramatically as well. So key piece of information. Now from a design standpoint, we really have a couple of approaches to doing solar. Uh, both of these are available residentially. Really one of them is where we tend to see the work being done on a commercial standpoint. Okay. It's referred to as either a two tank preheat system or a one tank preheat system. And we always talk about preheat because we have to have that second source of heat. So two tank preheat system, this is what we, we see a lot of in residentially and this is what we will see in commercial. A tank or tanks dedicated solely to the energy that's coming off of the solar collector so I'll have a tank, I'll have my solar collector. Here's my pumping station to move the fluid. Here's my expansion tank and my relief valve. And then here's my solar controller here. And from a control standpoint, solar is just about differential temperatures. So sensor up on the collector, sensor down on the tank. In most cases, it's gonna be uh, at least a 15 degree delta T. When the collector is 15 degrees hotter than uh, down here at the tank, the pump is started because we know we have solar energy that we can deposit in the tank. So from a solar standpoint, everything is a variation of this right here, okay? So in a two tank system, we have one tank dedicated to solar and one tank dedicated for our backup heat source. So solar only heat, backup heat. And what happens is I pick up what energy I can in the solar preheat tank, so as cold water comes in, it goes into the solar preheat tank, it gets heated, and then it goes into the backup heat source. And if the solar, the water, hot water provided from here to here is hot enough, the backup heat source doesn't come on at all. But if the, because of the solar conditions, if I'm only picking up some heat here, you know, let's say it's not getting up to 120 or 130 degrees, let's say it's only getting up to 95 degrees, I pick up what I can off of solar, and then the backup tank 
then will bring the temperature up the rest by coming up partially rather than you know, utilizing all the energy to bring it up to, uh, to the desired water temperature. Okay. Now, the one downside of this, and there are a couple of ways to correct it that probably will go into a later presentation, but the one downside with the two tank system is because there's no water moving freely between the two, you may be in a condition where this heat, this tank is sitting there at 130 degrees, yet your backup heat source fires because of standby loss on the tank. So that is one, one way, one thing that you have to be aware of when you do that two tank system. One way around it is do a recirc between the two of them off of a delta T between the tank, but I think that's probably a topic for, for later on in another, maybe another presentation. Now, the one tank design is one that we see uh, a bit of in, uh, in the residential market. So rather than having a single a tank with a single coil just doing um, solar heating and then a separate tank doing uh, input from uh, the backup source, here we have solar heat, we have backup heat in here. So it's a, a tank with two coils built into it. Top coil is always space heating, bottom coil is always solar. Why solar on the bottom? We want the backup coil, the backup heat, only to be able to recover the top half of the tank. We always want the bottom half of the tank as cold as possible so that we have maximum storage space available for solar. Nice thing about this is when the solar recovers the bottom half of the tank, when it equalizes with top half temperature, it can add energy to the entire volume of the tank. It gets it down to a single footprint and I don't have to worry about the boiler firing unnecessarily to recover this tank, a tank when the rest of the water is hot enough, the two of them equalize internally. Okay. With this, typically we see it with a 80 and 120 gallon tanks. So this is a, a one tank design. Okay. From a standpoint of the, the solar loop, same thing you see, same collectors, same pumping station, expansion tank relief valve, same control, it's just a different approach to the tank side of things. But when we do domestic hot water, it's generally a two tank or a single tank system. Or, uh, don't have a drawing for it, but single tank system, the backup heat could also be an instantaneous as well. That's kind of considered almost to be a two tank system. Okay. Now, one of the things that I've, you know, keep on throwing a little bit in here and there. You know, I keep talking about, oh, don't oversize the system. You know, we really don't want to reject heat, but it's something you have to consider when you look at the expectations of the building owner of what they want to do or the energy usage profile of the building. They're not using the same amount of domestic hot water five, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now we have to talk about overheating protection. Overheating protection is really about these spikes. I don't want these spikes to occur, so I'm going to put some sort of protection that on a day it might, you know, you're thinking about the spike of about 330 degrees. If I can keep the fluid moving through that collector and rejecting that heat somewhere, somehow, it keeps that temperature down, and then the problems are associated with that spike do go away. Okay, so a couple of ways of doing it. And this is really something that we, you can do, I'd say mostly in residential systems that aren't over designed, but you still may have to worry about high temperature spikes. Let's use the system and mother nature to take care of you. Now the thing with, I'm gonna actually go down to the bottom here, flat plate collectors, not only do they gather heat, but they can also reject heat. You know, nighttime where the, I have a solar fluid temperature that's higher than the outside air temperature, if I pass that fluid through that panel, I'll reject heat off of that panel. So method one is I utilize the brains of the controller to take care of this. And what I will do is I set the temperatures in the, the tank and through a couple of, of settings so that I don't stop at the temperature that I really want when I'm in a condition where the, I potentially see it stagnate. I allow the temperature to drift up higher through the setup of the control. I'm pulling extra energy in there that I really don't need, but I want to keep that pump moving on that collector. And then at nighttime, the collector then, the system then turns that pump on at night, takes that hot fluid, 
that that's extracts the heat out of the tank and rejects it out through the collector. Yeah. So this is for something that you know you're worried about stagnation, but it's not it's not a regular thing. It's something that might happen occasionally that you want to be protected from, and you have a flat panel. The other direction is using an outlet mechanism. You know, you'll hear it referred to as a heat dump, but I want to have something that dissipates the heat so that I don't generate that high temperature that spikes the collector and also shuts the pump off because I've reached my high limit. Okay, so when do I, when are these recommended? If a system has no summertime load, you know, then I got to start thinking about doing a, a heat dump. Or long, long unoccupied periods, schools, winter homes, you know, things like that. Dementis hot water with intermittent loads. If the system is oversized, and we try to avoid the oversized system, but sometimes it happens because somebody wants a real high solar fraction. And the other thing is, anytime we look at a T-cell, and we looked at, we've seen this a couple of times there, where it shows the collector temperature spiking above 230. So these are all times that we have to take a look at having this heat rejection loop, okay? So what do we do for heat rejection loop? You know, it could be a usable outlet. It, you know, it could be a fan coil unit. Could be fin tube radiator, could be a ground loop, you know, where we simply take it, we pipe it in, and a lot of times we'll do a three way valve that changes position. When the temperature gets high enough here, rather than shutting the pump off, the system will go into rejection. It will simply shift the position of this valve. Hot fluid leaves the collector, gets rejected, and then it's simply pumped back around again. So we'll do something like this. And again, this is gonna be sized based on 220 BTUs per hour per square foot of collector. You know, back from that number that we saw um, earlier in the presentation. Okay. The other way is, you know, I can say, okay, you know what? Let me just take a two coil tank and let's use that top coil rather than an input for backup heat, let's use it to extract heat. So I can bring it into additional storage. I can bring it into a heating circuit. I can use a pool as a heat dump. I can do a hot tub. I could do a snow melting system. You know, all of these are applications where I can utilize dumping heat. Uh, from Pat's experience, we have hot tub on there. Hot tubs only work if um, it's a big hot tub and you don't really oversize the collectors. You know? We don't want you to dump so much heat in the hot tub that you can boil the officers. I've seen somebody do that, come pretty close to that before. And again, the heat dump is gonna be based at, um, or the heat rejection is gonna be based on 220 BTUs per hour per square foot. So covered a lot of distance in this uh, hour and a uh, couple more minutes. Oh, one last one. I, I keep on forgetting about this one because it's not one of my favorites. I can also put in a motorized mixing valve and physically dump the hot water down a drain. To me, you know, it's one thing to dump energy, but what we see with the uh, availability of water, I always hate to waste water. So this is some way that it can be done. I know of applications that it has been done at schools, for instance, but to me, it's a waste of water. But if it's, if it's the only methodology that's available, this is all, all, also a method as well. So we covered a lot of ground today. Uh, I'm not gonna read back through the learning objectives. Uh, we pretty much have covered everything we, we set out to do. So what I wanna do now is to bring uh, Miranda back into the picture and let's see if we have any questions. We do have a question, Jody. Do any manufacturers offer flat plates that can protect the systems from stagnation and or overheating? And if so, how does that work? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, there are some coatings out there that uh, when you put the coating out there, when it hits a certain temperature, the coating actually starts to, I'm gonna use the term shade, it starts to, it actually starts to lose the ability to allow the, the, ther the solar energy to penetrate and uh, raise the heat up. So it is out there and uh, based on this, it, and um, since we've gone beyond this, this is a coating by the way that um, our flat plates have, and I think that's why somebody was asking, but it does help significantly with the stagnation but the thing is, from a safety standpoint, I, I tend to not want to rely on that coating to take care of it. I would still rather have the heat dump in there, but it does dramatically drop the impact of uh, that. 
The next question, does the hot water dump melt PVC drainage piping? Um, well, PVC drainage piping, maximum temperature for PVC is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have, um, if you're going to dump, you're probably gonna end up trying, yeah, I'd, I, if, if you had PVC drainage, I would probably put a mixing valve on that dumping to make sure I maintain the water temperature below because a lot of time we start to look at stagnation so that we're not dumping water early. We may actually bring the temperature in the tank all the way up to 180 degrees, which is not unheard of and something like that. So to, to this question, if you have PVC drainage, absolutely pay attention to it because uh, evidently the person that just wrote this, I know the individual says, I've seen it done. Uh, they're a great, great question and a great input on that, Jim. Thank you. But yes, be, be wary of it if you have PVC because of that 140 degree uh, limit. And with that, I think that's our last question. So what I'm going to do, oh, that's, do we have one more? Or? Nope, that's it. So what I'm gonna do is uh, turn it over to Miranda. I wanna, I wanna thank you all for coming and spending uh, an hour of your day with us. And with that, Miranda, that's all you. Great, thank you, Jody. Just a few reminders before we close out. As stated, a recorded version of this webinar will be posted in the video library within the next week or so, so you will be able to go rewatch it at that time. If you wanted the PDH credit, we will be sending certificates out within about five business days once you do fill out that survey in the follow-up email. If you think of any additional questions, feel free to email me. We will be putting together a Q&A document that will be sent out to all the attendees today that will have all of the answers to those questions. And lastly, if you're not aware, the Wiesman Academy holds monthly webinars beyond this rapid fire session uh, for the COVID-19 quarantine. Um, so keep an eye on the website for that. And then we will be extending our webinar offerings until May 17th um, for this COVID-19 quarantine period. So keep an eye out for that as well. With that being said, that does conclude our webinar today. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful day.